The opulent decor, the soothing music, the coiffured salespeople. The luxury boutique is where the affluent and fashion conscious have made their sartorial purchases for half a millennium. There was a time when futurists believed that people would never purchase clothing they could not touch, much less at the price point of a Burberry scarf or a pair of Gucci slides. Today, those buys are routinely made from the backseat of cars on mobile phones. Online? I am really hooked on online shopping. Possibly 75%. Um, and then when I have the willpower, then I go out into the shops. 70% in person and 30% online. Mostly I shop online. What's the expensive thing? A watch. I think it was a pair of jeans. I can't remember the brand, but it was quite expensive. I think it was shoes. It was from a Japanese company called Super Goopies. Five to eight hundred um, for a pair of shoes. Some entrepreneurs have managed to replicate the white gloves service of the luxury boutique online. The idea to kind of be like a curator, pick the best things out of different brands. We're very ambitious. We want to have the best PR company, the best uh, marketing, uh, best advertising. While others offer customers the opportunity to look a million bucks at a fraction of the price. You are subscribing to a wardrobe that you would not be able to financially support. If we get to a point where like, our customers' trust is broken, it will kill this concept. How did they change the way we shop and write the future of fashion? Their mass production laid the foundation for a revolution in the making of clothes in the post-war year. It would be a virtual department store and take e-commerce to the next level. It was a sharing economy um, for fashion. That was what we wanted to create. I just really wanted to build a dream world. If you lived before the 19th century, this would be how you shopped for clothes if you had money. And if you didn't, it was assumed that women in your household knew how to sew. It wasn't until the 19th century that a form of mass-produced clothing was developed. As the century wore on, better ready-made clothes along with the ease of travel led to the rise of the department store. To fine weave dress shirts, the sheerest of slips and blouses, bathrobes to rainwear to beachwear. Beginning with Le Bon Marché in France, department stores became a retail trend across the globe in the post-World War II years. The early ones catered to the tastes and buying powers of a rising new middle class of women, enriched by the Industrial Revolution. Along with westernization, these glittering temples of consumption made it into East Asian cities such as Shanghai and Tokyo from the early 20th century. In Singapore, Robinsons, founded in 1858, became a popular haunt for the European community and later a much-loved shopping destination for Singaporeans. And as long as there are things to buy, we've come up with new ways to shop for them. In 1979, English inventor Michael Aldrich connected a modified television to a telephone line and real-time transaction processing computer to give the world teleshopping. In 1984, 72-year-old Jane Snowball became the first e-commerce customer when she ordered groceries using her TV remote. The 1990s saw the rise of the internet. In 1992, Charles Stack started a dial-up bulletin board to sell books. Two years later, a New York Times headline proclaimed, Attention Shoppers. 
internet is open. It was at this time, in 1999, that Swedish entrepreneur Ernst Malmsten and his childhood friend Kaisa Lienda sold their successful online bookstore business, Bocus.com, and became newly minted millionaires. Suddenly one day, you know, I, I went with my car to the bank machine and I saw the amount in my bank account. I didn't really realize. So there was lots of money. That made that we could do something. We were independent, we could travel, we could spend money. And then we thought maybe we were too young to retire then. Uh, and we want to really do something bigger to conquer the world. At just 28 years old, the pair was hungry to build an even bigger online empire. We wanted to take the ownership of a category that no one else had taken before. So we were thinking clothes and sportswear online. No one had done that before. And we really wanted to own that sector. In short, they were going to be the next but sexier Amazon.com, a virtual department store where the cool and the chic buy their clothes. And they wanted to do it on a global scale. Lots of countries didn't have access to all these uh, sports and fashion items. At this time, lots of people read international magazines. You, you, you went to the newsstand and um, buy a magazine, but they couldn't get access to all the products. And the idea to kind of be like a curator, pick the best things out of different brands. And we also wanted to promote young, small, upcoming designers and make that available worldwide. But at the same time, to have the big design brands like Patagonia, Timberland, and the North Face, and so on. Ernst and Kaiser wanted to capitalize on a burgeoning global trend. In the late 90s, a subversive style of dress known as streetwear, donned by surfers and skateboarders in the 80s, was becoming mainstream. People were seeing their favorite athletes on TV in hoodies and sneakers. And hip-hop artist Run DMC appeared everywhere in their Adidas superstars. Sporting sportswear was now cool. This is Charles Drazen, who helped Ernst write a book on the Boo.com story. At a time where the idea that sportswear could be fashionable was a very new idea. Well, I can remember actually Ernst himself. He had a sense of fashion, probably instilled into him by Kaiser, I guess. So he would be wearing his Paul Smith suit, no tie, a pair of sneakers. And I can remember going home and we'd had a chat about what people are wearing, what cool people are wearing, and sitting on the tube and looking at people's footwear and suddenly noticing for the very first time, I'd never thought about this before, that maybe about 80% of people in the carriage were wearing uh, sneakers. I think there was a saying, wasn't there? The market was for sportswear for people who don't sweat. Years later, a different pair of entrepreneurs would also chance on the latest trend in fashion e-commerce. This tale begins with a perennial problem. I was actually working in the finance industry and I think just one day I was just complaining about oh I have nothing to wear again uh, and I think a lot of women can relate to that. This is Raina Lim and at the receiving end of that complaint was her boyfriend Chris Halim. I was like how can that be possible like you have two and a half different wardrobes so much clothes like how does that even make sense? The year was 2015 the Chinese e-commerce market was three times the size that of the US. Uber, Netflix, and Airbnb were taking off in Asia, and the age of fast fashion was well underway. Something interesting that we found was that around 80% of a woman's wardrobe uh, will only be worn a maximum of three times in the entire lifetime of the clothing. That led us to start thinking about how many women has this irrational problem with fashion. Can we create a solution for that? Can we allow women to share clothes? Because I'm sure that some item that is in some women's wardrobe that I would love to wear at this moment, but I'm just, I, I don't have access to that. Their concept was a bottomless wardrobe based on a subscription model. 
for a set price each month? A customer can choose three to five pieces of designer clothing at a time, as many times as they please. The clothes are delivered right to their doorstep, cleaned and fully pressed. Rent, wear, return, repeat. With only so many occasions to dress like a red carpet celebrity, Reina and Chris have found a gap in the rental market for basics. The biggest companies in fashion rental at a time were focusing on events rental, right? But for us, we saw that in Singapore, a lot of women even wear like uh, work dresses for their friends' weddings and stuff like that. So we thought to ourselves, what kind of use case is the best for Singapore? And we realized that actually, you know, day-to-day -day wearing, weekend wearing, and workwear wearing was definitely the part that was most interesting. But will the unproven concept gain traction? In the 1990s, the American economy was booming. Unemployment rate was at its lowest in over two decades. Americans had money to spend, and vendors took notice. At the same time, British computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee had just invented the World Wide Web, an information system accessible from any node on the network. Finally, your internet is ready. I can customize my email. My niece sent me a picture. If you have a phone line, you can be on. Build it and they will come. That was the catchphrase that summed up the year 1998. Everyone you spoke to was either talking about opening an online store or knew someone who was. Suddenly, people were aware of the fact that you could buy online and that it made everything so much incredibly easy. Those were the heady days of the dot-com bubble. It was characterized by all-time high investor confidence and free-flowing capital. Alan Greenspan, um, the Federal Reserve governor, he called it uh, irrational exuberance. Everyone was so hot in investing. This is business consultant Lawrence Kohler. When investors see that the internet was able to disrupt any business out there, any category, in a way that they could have access directly to any consumer or user um, and create potentially big, big companies um, that creates any investor to get really excited about. Jumping on the bandwagon were Swedish entrepreneurs Ernst Malmsten and Kaiser Leander. With a vision for the first fully branded shopping experience on the net, they called it Boo.com. Welcome to the Boo Millennium, not just M&M's. From a very early age, Ernst wanted to be an entrepreneur. He really liked the idea of making money, not in a venal sense, but in the sense of money the making of money actually being a creative activity. Kaiser would have brought the fashion awareness, the awareness of that world and how to negotiate your way within that world. Investor calls up, making sure that they are happy. Ernst would have brought the, the drive and the single-minded focus required to make it happen. Uh, that ability to push and push, but to do that 24 hours a day and not to rest until you've actually achieved the vision. How quickly will you be able to bring new lines online? We have 18 brands left to launch, and we're going to constantly add on more brands all the time. Uh, The site would offer unparalleled choice of brands, the convenience of a 24-7 internet, swift delivery, and excellent customer service. To convince skeptical investors they were a force to be reckoned with, the founders plan to launch simultaneously in 18 countries.
It was important that this should happen quickly. Survival of the fastest was another slogan from that time. The philosophy was that you had to, to get big as quickly as possible. So they went out in 18 markets, I think, simultaneously, just with a fantasy and a big load of cash, uh, something that was completely new and had no proof of concept. Boo.com were going to have its head office in London and satellite offices in New York, Stockholm, Copenhagen, Munich, and Paris. The first challenge was money, VC money. The team aimed their first round of fundraising at $15 million, then $25 million a few months later, and a further $40 million through an IPO on the stock market. We're very ambitious. We want to have the best PR company, the best uh, marketing, um, uh, best advertising. I mean, it was the global idea that made it attractive to all the investors. They liked the idea with worldwide deliveries, all these languages, free and fast deliveries and free returns. No one had done it at the time. So if we hadn't done it on such a big scale, I don't think they would have invested. Armed with their prototype website, the founders went on an aggressive campaign to raise capital. I mean, it was really elegant website, you know, Scandinavian uh, 60s look, you know. The graphics was very nice. And then we have the Miss Boo, the virtual um, assistant, you know, and she have a special hair and, uh, and uh, she, she ha helped customers. And then we have the, the, the spinning products, you know, uh, that can, you could zoom and, and see the different angles. At a time when web pages were simple 2D affairs, this was like nothing the world had seen before. The market bought their hype, and the Boo team raised $9 million from heavyweight fashion companies like LVMH and Benetton. They had managed to get on board some really big hitters to have LVMH committing itself to an e-commerce company in 1999. Must have been a sign to people, people out there that something really exciting was, was happening. Fast forward to today, online luxury sales has become a huge market, expected to hit 9 billion US dollars by 2025. Since 2009, a new breed of rental services like Rent the Runway have popped up to tempt every conceivable type of consumer. Women jumped at the opportunity to wear designer at a fraction of the item's retail price. In Asia, the concept has taken longer to catch on, given the taboo attached to wearing pre-owned clothes. I do wear second-hand clothes. When I was in university, I used to get my clothes from second-hand stores. I'd probably use it, you know, like, get to mix up your wardrobe. I'm open to the idea of wearing second-hand clothes, as long as they are in good condition. But I definitely know a lot of girls I know that think I've worn this outfit, you know, it's been on social media a few times, whatever. I can't wear it for at least another two months or something like that. From a sustainability perspective, the idea of renting and returning is a really good one. I'd consider it if it wasn't too pricey and if it allowed me to access brands I didn't know of and I found um, nice. There's a huge consumer trend that actually helps that kind of business. We call it a, a dematerialization where, where people everywhere in the world, and we see this already, are very happy not to own a car anymore, not to own a house anymore, not to have a traditional job. Almost in a, in a, in a funny way, trying to stay light, not being heavy, so I can actually move to the next opportunity. Banking on this new consumer mindset in 2016, Singaporean couple Raina Lim and Chris Halim began building Southeast Asia's first fashion rental platform, and they named it Style Theory. We are the co-founders of Style Theory. Mm. Hey. Yeah, last I checked, that's correct. <laughs> yeah. With a Style Theory subscription, you are subscribing to a wardrobe that you would not be able to financially support. You are getting access to um, items that are retailing at on average $300 per piece, and you will always get the right items for every kind of occasions that you have. 
In April, a soft launch of the app with 500 spaces was fully subscribed within a month. The waitlist quickly grew to more than 3,000 potential customers. I think the first thing that we may have underestimated at the beginning was how hard it was to um, get the right collection and from the right designers. Um, we literally had to cold call the designers. We want to call New York, we have, it would be like a 12 midnight or 1 a.m. from our time to make sure we can call in right after lunch or something like that. There were so many things that we didn't know. So um, when I'm actually talking to a designer based on the design, Chris will be in the background Googling all the jargons and then whispering it to me to be like, OK, this is what it means. So I would understand now and I'll continue that conversation with the designer. There are many reasons why our designers wouldn't want to, you know, allow someone to stock their inventory, right? They are afraid of brand dilution, of course. They are afraid of companies that are not aligned to the brand. There may be some other stockists in, in the region that might get unhappy about this as well. I think there's two things that really help for us. Um, number one is the fact that uh, fashion rental is a new concept, an exciting concept that they are familiar with. And at the same time, it's a concept that is not conflicting with any of their current stock stockists. That, I think, helped uh, in giving them that trust to start with a small collection uh, for us. But rather than trying to predict the tastes of a wide spectrum of women, Reina and Chris were looking for clothes for a specific type of customer. So um, a lot of the items here, you can actually wear it to work. It's also for your weekend casual. We have events wear, so maybe something for your wedding dinner. Meeting mother-in-law, you want something a little bit more cover-up, but not boring. Asian-specific event, for example, Chinese New Year, uh, red, orange, yellow and brown are really popular for us. At the very beginning, we actually thought that um, the latest things that are going to be on the runway will be the hottest hit in here in Asia as well. Um, but we quickly found out that that wasn't the case. And when you start digging deeper into the data and what people are using it for, you realise that Asian women tend to be a lot more practical in their consumption of fashion. So it's not about the latest trend, but it's about, oh, does it fit me and the occasion that I'm going to? So that was the reason why we also very quickly make sure that we procure clothes that are actually suitable for women in all the events that they have in their lives. For the first few months, Chris and Raina ran their startup out of a small 800 square foot apartment with a small team of part-timers and interns. But soon, they would need to scale up to meet new operational and clothing demands. We started getting to a point where like people were like packing boxes for customers under a staircase. It was just chaos. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Back in 1999, Boo.com, the soon-to-be global fashion e-tailer, was also in rapid expansion. And there were, there were queue, you know, everyone wanted investors at one stage, you know. People call up, you know, every day. Big banks, big investors, everyone wanted to be part of this. We couldn't wait too long, you know. We could hire and then they could start the next day, basically. But we hired really, really good people, you know, very talented young people, you know, from different sectors uh, around the world. And then suddenly, you know, everyone was sitting, two people in, on every desk, basically. And we didn't have space, you know. It was very electrified, the environment. The mysterious internet startup and its young Swedish founders were the talk of the town. We had a very bold and ambitious marketing plan. Did a campaign with Roman Coppola, but we also did a fly posting around the universities, uh, around in Europe, and that proved very successful. So we have a big plan, basically. We're going to get all the, all the press to write about us because we were very exciting, you know. Everyone was very curious about us, you know, who, who, who was these people from Sweden, who, who, who was Bill, you know, this very big company who's going to open. And it really became the most talked about internet company in the world at the time. With a marketing spend of $22.4 million, Boo.com had garnered 350,000 pre-registrations all of whom wanted to be notified of launch, set for the 1st of May, 2000. But the technological complexities that follow would push this date back with disastrous consequences.
With 164 million, or 56% of Southeast Asian adults shopping online in 2019, fashion retailers have a keen understanding of what drives online sales. Imagine a funnel. At the top, you have the people who have been attracted to a site, much like how a clever window display or promotion might get a shopper through the door. Once they're there, you'll need to pique their interest with attention-grabbing headlines, compelling copy, and a well-executed layout. The way well-placed selections and pricing might convince a shopper to take an item off the rack. Next comes creating desire. Buying decisions happen in the fitting rooms. Replicating those sensory experiences online involve using interactive features like 360 views, detailed zooming, and the ability to switch between colors, prints, and alternatives. Taking us finally to conversion. When shoppers put their credit card information in and hit pay, instead of abandoning a half-filled cart, Two decades earlier, with e-commerce in its infancy, this was exactly what Boo.com aspired to do. Tell me what you got. Stefan. Sorry, I can't um, speak. How you doing? Royal Elastics training. Um, Sarah. Very cool. We want to, to create something new. You know, we, we want to push the innovations. We want to have 3D images. You can spin around. You can see them different angles. With the Zoom virtual shopping assistant to help you. The website should be in different languages, different currencies. Uh, so we want all this you know, to help uh, and create a new consumer experience at that time. But as the launch date crept up on them, Boo's in-house technology team was struggling to deliver an incredibly complex platform. The system was made up of three parts. The front end, or look and feel, of the website, which involved everything from the online mannequin, zoomable 3D images, and the virtual assistant, Miss Boo. The e-commerce engine, a piece of software that processes all interactive requests on the website, from product searches to actual purchases. And finally, the back end, a complex administrative system that handled tasks like managing our product inventory, to shipping goods to customers. Each part had to be designed and built from scratch. Slightly worse shape than we thought we were. Oh, it's, it's, already, it's already expanding, it's making me nervous already. People are logging in and getting a switch of the language. Oh, the black products are really, really black. Oh my god. For today, for example, you can buy um, open source software for uh, $100 and you get about the same um, functionality like the build.com, but we need to spend $30 million on at that time. I mean, everything was so new. Uh, no one had done this before. Uh, for example, the servers, they took up several huge rooms and we had to have a security team in place uh, to, to, to watch these super expensive servers. Um, the back-end technology with all the 3D images, multi-brand, logistics, shipping, multi-currency and call centers in, in multi-language. I thought maybe we never could launch that. Maybe this is, uh, we have built something, a spider net of technology we, we can't really solve, you know. The magnitude of the challenge is something we did not realize at the beginning and um, I'm quite glad we did not. The launch now had to be pushed back, but Boo.com had grown into a company of 400 people with a massive payroll and no incoming revenue. Their investors agreed to pump in more cash to keep the lights on in the interim, but the Boo team had to race to fix its tech. We gather all the troops, everyone together in the office, and we start this product launch, you know. And we, we need to redo a lot of things, you know, from the beginning again. And we set up very clear timelines and, and um, I think we'll say about 10,000 um, tasks, what, what we need to do. And everyone in the company really come together, you know, to, to try to fix this. We're going to be um, 20 minutes from launch for the next five hours, but we're all very excited. Finally, they made it to launch day, 3rd of November, 1999 
We were all standing in the office in Carnaby Street and it was an electrifying atmosphere in the office. Everyone were gathered around Ernst uh, for the countdown and then we were counting down and finally we pressed the button. <laughs> Three, two, one. It's almost like you um, people uh, launch a rocket to the moon or something. We have worked so hard, you know, day and night, you know, to get this up and running. But although the platform delivered an incredible experience, it was far beyond the technical capabilities of most dial-up setups of that time. That meant users had to wait minutes for the site to load. Around 50,000 visitors visited the site on the first day but only four in a thousand placed orders. That's a 0.25% conversion rate. We were told that the bandwidth would go faster and the development, but it didn't go as fast as the telecom company said. Two decades later, customer experience was also top of mind at the young fashion rental startup, Style Theory. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Reina. We are the co-founders of Style Theory. Its founders, Chris and Reina, had secured a first round of funding and moved their operations into a 3,000 square foot warehouse and office. But they were still struggling to cope with the crazy demand in an incredibly time-sensitive business. We started realizing customers churning, like leaving the platform, because they didn't get their clothes on time. They were disappointed that the, the plans that they have made around the fact that the clothes were supposed to arrive in, say, on Monday are, are not being fulfilled nicely. If we get to a point where, like, our customers' trust is broken, then they will never come back. It will kill this concept. Despite having partnered with over 30 logistics firms, nothing seemed to work. That's because while most e-commerce logistics solutions may be efficient on the way to the customer, but returns or reverse logistics that don't bring in any revenue are given less priority. It's a key and important part of our business. Everything that we've sent out must return. Logistics doesn't just stop when we collect the items back from the customers. It actually continues on to um, the dry cleaning process, you know, how we hang all the clothes, how we categorize the different clothes for cleaning and washing. And then from then onwards, it will actually come back to us in a manner that is pressed and ready to be sent out to customers. I still remember the days where, you know, uh, boxes are not sent out on time and neither are they being written back on time, leading to customer dissatisfaction. And then, you know, I had to drive to the, our third-party logistics warehouse, um, pick it up from them and deliver it by hand to our customers, right? We got to a point where we realised that we had to invest to make sure that we had enough fleet, we had enough uh, support and coverage to be able to have a, create a great experience for our customers. In 2017, Style Theory brought logistics in-house, building its own fleet of delivery vans and a customized warehouse management system. It also introduced a feature called Lock and Go, securing parcels to the customer's doors to be collected at their convenience. It sent satisfaction rates soaring from 85 to 99%. The Style Theory team has also used another powerful tool to their advantage. To explain, here's business operations manager Jamie Tan. Women out there have many different kinds of preferences. So as we acquire new subscribers, we want our inventory to continuously be relevant for them. Unlike a lot of retail platforms where customers transact with that platform maybe four times a year, six times a year, our customers transact with us multiple times a month. This means we know what they are looking for, what they're clicking into, what they're actually renting, and even the reviews of how they like that piece. So we're very fortunate to have a lot of data that we can look into when we make our buys. And then there is the problem of sizing. So something that you may not know about the fashion industry is that every brand's definition of size is different. Even though, you know, it may be two European brands, uh, maybe from the same country, um, but what they define as XS, S, or maybe UK2 in another uh, brand can be totally different. That's not to say no one has tried to enforce standard sizing. In 1939, 
the U.S. Department of Agriculture attempted to standardize women's clothes by measuring 15,000 women. The Mail Order Association of America reanalyzed this in the late 1940s, creating a largely arbitrary standard from 8 to 38 with height and girth indications. As American girth increased, so did egos, and thus began the practice of vanity sizing. The government found it harder and harder to regulate the clothing industry, and by 1983, private retailers were left completely free to set their own guidelines. Finding the perfect fit from our infinite wardrobe can be a little tricky. But here are some tips to make sure your favourite selections fit you every single time. With an offering of over 300 designers, the Style Theory team had to come up with a way to help customers find the perfect fit across different brands. When new items arrive, they're measured and those figures input into what is called the fit algorithm. Our customers can easily input their measurements on our platform and we know the measurements of our own clothing. Uh, so we can easily just match them together and we'll, they'll be able to know what uh, clothes will fit them best. We recently added a new layer of intelligence through uh, machine learning as well, where basically uh, based on a customer's like reviews, we can tell uh, if their perfect size should change over time. And anytime you want to rent something, you can just press here and you'll be able to see our fit algorithm immediately at work. Now in this fit algorithm, the right recommended size for this person's uh, profile is actually medium, right? Where you can see it immediately over there, good fit. But let's say if they choose to go to XXS instead, obviously it'll be too tight. You know, if they go to S, it'll be slightly tight. If they go to L, it'll be too loose. November 1999, Boo.com became the world's first multi-brand fashion e-tailer, offering a shopping experience like no other with worldwide deliveries, free returns, and multi-language customer support. By May 2000, the team had managed to fix most of their initial user experience issues. The website was loading much faster, sales were growing rapidly, and the company was turning $500,000 in revenue. But by following an aggressive growth path, Boo.com had swallowed four times the expected initial investment and needed plenty more. The assumption was that venture capital money would see the company through the first few years of trading until they could turn a profit. But such capital soon ceased to be available when the dot-com bubble finally burst. We thought, you know, that we have a tap of money, you know, we can just turn on the tap when we, wherever we want it, you know. Uh, and in hindsight, that's very, very dangerous things to do. March 10th, 2000. From its peak, the NASDAQ stock index begins a spectacular downward slide. And what happened then uh, when the bubble was bursting is that the interest rate rose, rose and they were, they were higher and, and it was really harder to get to the cash and all of a sudden uh, it dried up as a supply. And then many companies were absolutely incapable of making a profit. And that ultimately led then to many of these, hundreds of these companies would go bust. That was all over the news, you know, that you know, this was the end of the dot-com, you know. 18th of May, 2000. Boo's senior management team was frantically trying to scrape together $20 million of operating expenses. The world changed overnight. It was kind of changed from sunshine to rain. So suddenly people started to question internet and valuation. And we tried to, everything in our power to convince the investors to continue investing. Uh, I remember we were sitting negotiating with them till five o'clock in the morning. Some of the investors wanted to invest more, but then there were some that were blocking it because they would get too diluted. They played, it, played each other's out, basically. investment was raised. It was too little, 
too late. And at midnight, less than a year after its launch, Boo.com closed. And it's always a fine line between um, success and failure. It's always, it's not like, uh, uh, and more risk you take, higher risk, also things goes wrong. And everything's about the timing. It was a shame we couldn't continue. I believed in it until the very, very end. And I think it would have been a su huge successful company today if we had survived May 2000. But Boo's efforts wasn't all for naught. Behind the complicated interface, the team had created a sophisticated system combining logistics and the web. That system has gone on to power some of the biggest e-commerce engines in the marketplace today. When Chris and Reyna launched Style Theory in 2016, they were the first fashion subscription service in Southeast Asia. But this niche market is a promising one. Led by China, Asian spending on online rented apparel is predicted to increase 11.4% annually between 2017 and 2023. Although similar startups like Mad Thread and the Treasure Collective have emerged on the rental scene, Style Theory pushed ahead with its coverage, inventory size, and affordability. Since its founding, Style Theory has expanded to cover three territories, Singapore, Indonesia, and Hong Kong, with a much wider and smarter service. Starting in 2017, they partnered with various automated locker providers, co-working spaces, and department stores to make collections and returns more seamless. In 2018, they introduced luxury bag rentals, a consignment model for customers' bags and apparels, as well as restoration service. All right, so this is the Dior Book Talk. It is a really popular bag at the moment. It's on the hands of lots of Instagrammers, a lot of influencers. Okay, close okay, up look. All right. And once another picture. So just do a few spots. All right, and it's happy. Well, it's quite specific. It just wants the CHR and I, so I can do that. Consider the hour. And we're all done. Submit for verification. Then we just hit that button. So we've got the result from Entropy, and we know this bag is 100% authentic. And we're going to move on to the next step, which is to attach an RFID thread in the interior of the bag. This helps us to identify that the bag is the same bag that goes out each time it's rented out. We started wanting to build a sharing economy for fashion, but right now it has evolved into a very different way for women to actually interact with fashion. So the entire idea of a circular um, fashion um, concept has actually enabled different types of women, whether you want to rent, buy pre-love, consign, or just restore your item, you're able to interact with this circular fashion concept um, from a lot of different angles. I think the COVID time is really trying because it, it happened so quickly and I think the business just quickly has to really um, figure out how to adapt to all the market changes. You know, we start to see people renting more tops as well, maybe for the Zoom meetings that they are in. And what we did was we worked with a lot of local designers to really onboard a lot of um, casual wear that will be a lot more suitable for a time like now. The Style Theory platform now boasts more than 200,000 registered users, 30,000 designer outfits, and 300 designer brands, the largest of its kind in Southeast Asia. And this story has more than one happy ending. The first two years, I'll say, uh, we almost work seven days a week consistently, and so having dinner, talking about work happen at the same time, all the time. Fortunately, we got married as well, so that's good. If we really follow on with the women's journey, there's also kids wear, right, that we could even 
potentially consider. We have been asked so many times, are we going to ever carry anything for men? So um, doubling down in all the markets that we are currently in is still our strategy. Uh, we are also definitely going to expand into new markets that has a very similar profile with the market that we're in right now. In the last two decades, the luxury fashion landscape has undergone a complete transformation. By men and women who tore down geographical barriers and monetary ones, democratizing what was once exclusive and expensive perhaps even creating a more sustainable way we dress ourselves in the future.